Good morning, everybody. Good morning and welcome to U.S. Institute of Peace. Uh, my name is Nancy Lindborg, and I'm delighted to welcome you here this morning to our bipartisan congressional dialogue here at U.S. Institute of Peace. I want to give a special welcome to the cadets in our audience uh, from our Service Academy Education and Development Initiative. Welcome. Glad to have you here. Um, and for those who have not been with us before, um, U.S. Institute of Peace was founded by Congress um, in 1984 as an independent, nonpartisan national institute that's dedicated to reducing and resolving violent conflict around the world that threatens our national security. And we do this by working on the ground with local partners um, in hot spots around the world, uh, providing policy, knowledge, very practical tools so that conflict can be prevented um, and resolved. And we are honored to have here with us today Congressman Francis Rooney from Florida and Congressman Bill Keating from Massachusetts. Thank you, gentlemen. Both congressmen serve on the House Foreign Affairs Subcommittee on Europe, Eurasia, and Emerging Threats. And they are two thoughtful, important leaders on national security issues. So we're delighted to have them with us. And they join us here today for the fourth event in our bipartisan congressional dialogue series. And th this is a series that features foreign policy discussions, national security questions, um, and enables members of Congress from both so sides of the aisle um, to get together for this conversation. And the series was launched earlier this year to provide a platform for members of Congress who are working from opposite sides of the political spectrum to advance common interests. And I know that you'll hear about that today. Um, as a nonpartisan organization, we believe very strongly um, in fostering these kinds of bipartisan efforts to strengthen national security. And we found that despite what you read in the paper, there is genuine, substantial interest in the Hill in coming together, um, especially on these kinds of critical issues, to promote real solutions thoughtfully. And our conversation today will focus on Russia, a 21st century disruptor in Europe. Um, this is an issue of increasingly urgent concern. Um, we're seeing the return of great power competition with an aggressive Russia threatening the established liberal world order that the U.S. and its allies have upheld for the last 70 years. And this includes Russian interference in democratic elections across Europe. Um, we've seen Russia intimidating neighboring countries, especially through the invasion and annexation of territory um, in Georgia and Ukraine. And so today we have an opportunity to talk about what we should do with our European allies uh, to protect the democratic process, to uphold the rule of law, and counter the disruptive ag aggression of Russia as it uh, moves to threaten this order. Um, in recent months, USIP has driven a track to dialogue process uh, to generate new solutions and build momentum specifically towards a resolution of the conflict in Donbass. And in fact, our executive vice president, Bill Taylor, and senior advisor, Charles North, um, have just returned from a trip to Ukraine where they're developing a new grassroots dialogue process to bring together Ukrainians uh, from both sides of the line of contact in Donbass. Um, we've also recently uh, hosted an event here with Heritage Foundation, marking 100 years since the founding of the first Georgian Republic with the Georgian Prime Minister. And of course, the invasion 10 years ago of Russia featured prominently in that discussion. Um, so um, we have a very thoughtful discussion ahead of us. I've, um, Honor to be able to welcome to the stage two very uh, accomplished congressmen. Uh, we'll have a productive conversation. I invite all of you to follow USIP on Twitter, at USIP, and join today's conversation using the hashtag BipartisanUSIP. Um, with that, please join me in welcoming to the stage Congressman Francis Rooney and Congressman Bill Keating. Um, Bill's but, here. Yeah, and Perfect. there. Thank you. But, All right. So 
um, thank you very much both for joining us. Uh, Congressman Rooney, I want to give you the floor first if you want to make a few opening remarks. Sure. Okay. Yeah. Remember, I'm not a professional at this, so it's better to have notes. <clears throat> Things can really twist off sideways if I don't. First, I want to thank Nancy and Bill and everybody at USIP and my friend Steve Hadley for all the great work they do and my colleague Bill Keating for coming and taking time to be here with us as well. I thought I might just quickly hit a few of Russia's current foreign policy objectives as we see them. I don't know that I've got it right. But you know, a lot of the problems that we're facing stem from the lost territories. They lost two million square feet, uh, square miles, uh, when they lost the Warsaw Pact in Ukraine and Georgia, and I don't think they've gotten over it. In fact, it's smaller than when Catherine the Great reigned. Um, they have no natural borders, which factors into that as well, other than the Arctic and the Pacific. And then you factor in that historic Slavic Russian insecurity and feeling of um, alienation. It's a dangerous combination with Putin, you know. Um, if you go back to history, the Kevin Roos, uh, when he looks at the Ukraine, it's kind of like the way we look at Texas. If it wasn't for the um, um, uh, uh, Moscow, uh, the barbarians up in uh, Moscow, uh, the, the capital of Russia might be Kiev right now. You never know. So now what do we have? They're down driving out the Tatars in, in uh, Crimea. They're doing the same kind of ethnic cleansing, uh, Russian uh, positioning of people that they did in the stands in the 50s and 60s. They're doing it now in Crimea. So we have a lot of problems with that. At the same time, they're, they're trying to see disruption in the West and exploiting the immigration issue and a few things like that, cyber attacks. And uh, it's got the appearance of a bit of a zero-sum game, which is not, not so good. The, the other thing, of course, is energy. We'll probably talk about energy a lot. It's, um, they're, they're exploiting it as a geopolitical tool, and we, we somehow or another need to uh, get Europe to understand the whole perspective of the Nord Stream 2 pipeline and focus more on the Denmark pipeline, Transcaucasus pipeline, and more LNG in Europe to get, get free. This is something that we were working on back in George Bush's time uh, in 2003, and we still have not made the kind of headway that we should. Um, and then last, of course, is the military threats. You know, we, we have the, uh, the, they have the ability to probably occupy the Baltic in four days if they wanted to bad enough. Uh, so I would be arguing for NATO to move some operations east. In fact, I remember talking to John Thune when, uh, when, when Putin first went into the Ukraine. I was talking to Thune and Rubio, and I said, if it were me, I'd start some military exercises in Poland and Lithuania tomorrow. But we still don't seem to have got with a clear way forward on that. I think we need to raise the price of Putin's aggression. You know, he's gotten South Ossetia, Abkhazia, now Crimea, and Donbass virtually free. So at least recently, I think we put the javelins into Ukraine. That's a good start. Got the missiles going into Poland and at some point Romania. That's a second good start. And maybe one of the points Trump has is that Europe needs to pay up a little more for their defense. Uh, our Eastern European allies are paying up. And so the last thing I would say is uh, soft power diplomacy and an opportunity to shape, shape the curve. Uh, and I think institutions like the USIP could be very important in that, the convening power that you explo exploit, just like right here, the um, ability to go where other people can't, perhaps offers part of the solution in the Ukraine and Georgia and an opportunity to promote democracy, working maybe with the Board of Broadcasting Governors and VOA and some, some other institutions uh, that can exploit Russia's shortcomings and, and leverage our democratic values in, in Eastern Europe. I know from personally visiting with the Georgians and Ukraines the last couple of weeks, they are desperate for more interchange, more investment, more ties with the United States and Georgia. It'd be a real shame not to take advantage of that. So thank you for having me. I look forward to visiting. Thank you, Congressman. Well, Nancy, thank you, and uh, I'd like to thank uh, USIP, t you know, for this opportunity. Uh, you know, uh, Francis and I uh, serve on the Foreign Affairs Committee in the House together, and, and it's reassuring, I think, to know that in this day and age, with what you hear about Congress, that uh, by far the most bipartisan committee in the House is the Foreign Affairs Committee, and, and it's not by accident. We actually work at it uh, because we realize what we say there, what we do there, what we produce there has enormous impact 
outside the world. I remember my first year, uh, we were speaking about something, and I had a line of questioning. And by the time I got through the, his, uh, the uh, hearing, my office said, by the way, what you just said was broadcast in the other country uh, during that period. So uh, what we do and say is important. We realize it. And I think we have the opportunity for an increasing role, particularly in today's uh, foreign affairs environment going forward. Now, we're talking about Russia today. Uh, and Russia with the <laughs> would be very pleased that we're talking about Russia today. Uh, because to me, uh, in terms of their influence economically and other weight that they carry, they're sort of a welterweight, you know, punching above their weight class. And, and the more they're getting attention and getting uh, any kind of international respect in that, re that way, it helps them domestically at home, where they have some difficulties. Uh, but it also uh, increases uh, their ability to take a strategy that looks like chaos, uh, and taking advantage of chaos in the world, but is much more strategic than that. Uh, I think they're akin to uh, a person that wants to be at the poker table, wants to be able to influence how high the ante goes up, wants to influence what the rules of the game uh, would be to any extent, uh, but then also choose when to sit back and let the games occur around them. It's, a, it's an interesting uh, and strategic way that they operate. Uh, their influence today is, on many fronts, is important. The way they're uh, economically using uh, the energy issue, uh, which is vital to their uh, existence economically, but also they're using it as a tool, uh, and it's a national security issue for us here and for our allies in the West. Uh, the incursions uh, that Francis just spoke about uh, in Europe, in Georgia, Moldova, what's going on there, as well as the Ukraine, as well as Ukraine are all issues uh, that demonstrate what they're doing. Syria, which we may or may not get into, Nancy, is uh, really intriguing because it's a work in progress along that way. But also the interference that they've been so successful with. And this is something they can do in such a cost-effective manner. Uh, their cyber attacks, their cyber program uh, does not cost them much, relatively speaking, for the effectiveness that they've gotten out of it. And the way they're using it against the West, including the U.S., is something we have to deal with as well. Uh, the, the better news is this. Uh, with what Russia has been doing, we still stand in a position, the U.S. and our allies, stand in a position to have exert so much influence over uh, any uh, malign activity that they might be involved with, as well as uh, what they're trying to do to disrupt our historic coalitions in the West. And, we have to take advantage of that. In fact, our policy, and I think it could be something Francis and I agree on, uh, but many members of Congress agree on, uh, we can influence more through trade and our uh, economic influence, working with our, our allies to increase our strength and diminish uh, people, you know, countries like Russia, and, and for that matter, China. So the opportunities are there as well. So as we go through the discussion today, I, I hope it's just not Focusing, I hope people don't come away with the feeling that, wow, Russia is really, uh, you know, creating great disruption and they're creating a problem we're having difficulty dealing with. They are, but also, we have the ability to do so much more to counter those acts. And so, hopefully, we'll hear a lot of that as the discussion progresses. So, thank you for being here. Thank you. That's a great tee up from both of your opening comments. Um, but before we go further, you alluded to it a little bit, Representative Keating. At a time of heightening partisanship, how, how, is, how does that work that you're able to keep a bipartisan approach? Well, how did you two come to work together um, on some of these critical issues? You want me to go first? Go ahead. Well, we have a, if you look back at history, all of our most important uh, foreign policy accomplishments have been bipartisan. I mean, Thomas Jefferson didn't want to go after the Barbary pirates. He was the pacifist of the group, but he did because he knew it was important, and, and Adams prevailed on him to do it. Go f flash forward to Scoop Jackson and Henry Kissinger with the, with the Russian Jews and taking pe Pepsi Cola to Russia. You mentioned about trade. Uh, so now we're at a point now where if we're going to engage Europe and and, and promote democracy in these new uh, new countries. We're going to we're going to need uh, all the help we can get, and we don't need rancor in, in the middle of our own country. Yeah, and, and fast forwarding uh, from the historical perspective to today, uh, the leadership of the committee and the subcommittees, we work at it. I mentioned we work at it. Uh, sometimes 
uh, we delay uh, getting into some subject matters uh, where there might be conflict uh, that overtakes what we're trying to accomplish. We also, as a committee, uh, I believe, uh, and this is what the Congress is about, this is what the legislative process is about, we do believe that progress is important. Maybe you can't get everything you want on one bite, but let's move the ball forward. And we have that attitude, we work together. Now that does not mean there aren't moments in the committee or it wouldn't be any fun to be on the committee. Uh, there are moments in the committee where back and forth uh, in questioning and hearings, uh, uh, things can get aggressive and, and uh, provocative, but that's also a role. But it's realizing that there should be a reason for that. It shouldn't be a, a political reason to be provocative, but that you want to really have the opportunity to engage greater depth and discussion on an issue and probe uh, and get some of the witnesses beyond, and some of the people here have been witnesses, uh, get them beyond uh, what they came in for with their barriers so that we can learn more. So uh, it, it's, it's the most exciting committee, I believe, to be on. And I think it's one of the most productive. And as we go forward uh, in the world today, it's, it's going to be one of the most important committees. Great. Well, we thank both of you for that spirit and attitude on these critical issues. So let's dive in. Um, I, you both mentioned the role that Russia is playing in threatening its neighbors in both incursions and annexations. It's, it's creating a lot of anxiety among all of the border states. What, what should we be doing? What's our role in supporting those countries? Should we be helping them become more resilient? Are there things that we should be doing? Um, this is one of the critical ways in which Russia is being disruptive. Do you go first? Go ahead. Okay. Well, yeah, I mean, all you gotta do is look at the uh, situation in Italy to realize how effective, they, and the alternative for Germany to see how effective they've been. I think that we need and, to and do- that, those aren't even the border states. Right, yeah. <laughs> and, and, the, and the, again, the desperate pleas of these people from Georgia and the Ukraine uh, going around our offices all the time saying, please help us, please engage with us, please promote democracy here, and, and uh, help them with their customs and their borders and things like that. So. I think to counter Russia, we ought to be doing the same thing to them that they're doing to us, which I have some information that's fairly comforting in that respect, with cyber. And I think that we need to uh, promote democracy shamelessly as the better way with our new neighbors in Eastern Europe and uh, deploy people like uh, USIP and the Board of Broadcasting Governors. You know, one, one positive thing in Iran right now, the Board of Broadcasting Governors beams radio and Farsi, they have 17% 17 market share. I wonder if we could ever get that way in Russia. Because they only get the Putin line. They only get yeah. that the, the paranoid, hostile, insecure history of Russian diplomacy. And if we could give them the other side, like worked in the Warsaw Pact, we might have something. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we also uh, economically have to do everything we can, and, and the energy is, is a great issue to use. Uh, so they can't use that economic issue as a, as a tool. So they can't have the cold winters uh, that they do and use that uh, to exert uh, all kinds of democratic or anti-democratic uh, activities with that threat. Uh, so clearly uh, energy issues, which we'll get into, uh, I'm sure are gonna be one of the critical center points the overall economy, uh, making sure that uh, the rule of law uh, exists there and the institutions are there, and, and honestly helping uh, some countries, Ukraine uh, being among them uh, on corruption issues. So these are, it's a pretty full slate of what we can do. Uh, we can't do it uh, and require these things, but we can exert greater influence than we are now, I believe. Uh, I think a lot of people in, in our country view many of these things too much through a military prism because uh, whether we arm, uh, you know, provide lethal defense weapons for Ukraine or not, certainly that's an issue for their existence. However, uh, Secretary Mattis, when he was addressing a small group of us recently, said that he views, and as Secretary of Defense, we should listen to him, uh, he views his role as a reinforcement. Uh, he said, uh, our military th is there to reinforce our position, to bolster our State Department and our diplomatic uh, efforts. So in his mind, and in my mind, uh, you know, I agree with him 100%, that it's, it's state, it's our diplomacy, that's at the top uh, of our, our ability to change things. Our military side of this is there to reinforce that mm -hmm. uh, and to create barriers uh, 
for conduct that you know is so counter that that we can't deal with it diplomatically. But that's where we have to focus, and, and I think we have to put a greater focus right now. There's been a, a, a fracturing uh, with the West right now, uh, whether it's you know with our Western alliances, uh, you know, in terms of the Paris uh, Treaty, uh, whether it's uh, the Iran nuclear deal. Uh, whether it's the current tariff situation, we have to realize there is a, uh, a fragmentation, there's a fracture that's there that we have to work hard uh, on making sure that that doesn't deepen. Uh, so we have a lot of work to do, uh, but beyond military, beyond some of the technical issues we could do, beyond the work for returning foreign fighters, where we both face that uh, threat from extremists, uh, and sharing information, we're doing all those things. We have to make sure economically and diplomatically, and when, when I say diplomatically, that includes rule of law uh, as well, issues, corruption issues. We have to make sure that there's as little daylight between us as we can. And that's our challenge right now. Between because, us and our allies. Yes. I mean, and you can do so much with Russia, uh -huh. but we can do more and be more influential controlling of the power we have together as an alliance. So, so, and, and you mentioned, uh, Congressman Rooney, about the influence not just on the border states, but going into Europe, Germany, Italy. How, how should, what should we be doing to reinforce that alliance? And do you see that as a key tool for addressing the Russian aggression? Yeah, I think like Congressman Keating said, I think that the, uh, the, the core of Europe needs to be our ally, and we do have some fence mending to do with some of the things that have happened recently. I mean, you take like sanctions. I mean, our san there's only so much we can do with sanctions. We need Europe to do it. Right. Look at the problem we've got in Iran right now. And so if we want to make our sanctions on, on Russia have teeth, we need Europe to join in that and not do the Nord Stream pipeline and a few fundamental things like that. So you both mentioned Europe, uh, energy a number of times. So what, what this, this is, obviously a, a, a tool, some leverage that Russia holds over Europe. W what should we be doing to uh, uh, lessen the power of the energy uh, leverage that Russia holds over Europe? Well, first of all, it's insidious to me that, that former Chancellor Schroeder is, on the, is like chairman of the Nord Stream Pipeline Consortium. And fortunately, a little bit of pressure recently has gotten Merkel to back off of her support of the pipeline. But that would be a, a, a much more uh, advance in Russia's ability to dominate energy in, in Europe, Eastern Europe and even Central Europe, if they could put that in. There's a, there's a pipeline coming from Denmark under sea to Poland. That will help. There's and a possibility. From, that, and say more about where that energy comes from. Uh, that come from Norway. Yeah, you know, they've still got a lot of oil in the North Sea. Uh, the other one that is there's talk about building a second trans Caucasus pipeline from Baku to Tbilisi, serve Georgia, and then go on down to Sehan. And Russia keeps talking everybody out of it. I think that's nonsense. I think we ought to, we ought to be supporting that openly. And then we need to make sure that we get enough uh, pipeline capacity into the Ukraine. This is something the Ukraine people were talking about the other day, because they don't want to get stranded as these new lines bypass the Ukraine. So we've got a lot of complicated issues, but they all come down to getting alternate energy uh, that's not Russian into uh, Europe and giving them the confidence that they can go it alone. And LNG has a role in that. You've got a lot of LNG right there in Qatar that could come right up the Red Sea to, to Turkey. Yeah, uh, and that's a great strength for the U.S. right now. We're an energy producer, uh, and we can do more. We had a hearing recently uh, on our subcommittee on trade uh, and nonproliferation and terrorism uh, in our committee dealing with LNG and oil and our ability to export that and have more influence that way, help our own economy and also be uh, providing diversity in the energy alternatives in Europe. Uh, just to give you one example of how that affects some of the other strategies, even though I think uh, Russia is doing it more for their own economy, which is in, in great difficulty now anyways. But one of the areas that it would affect would be Ukraine. Uh, Ukraine really has functions on its ability to be the middleman on many of these energy deals. If, if the pipeline comes through and expands, Nord Stream 2, is, if that thing expands, they're getting cut out further and further and further, and you, it's also hurting their economy. So. Uh, Russia understands the effects of these things and will use 
economic means in a cruel way sometimes with, with people uh, in a very a strong and harsh way. Uh, and that threat that has occurred before still remains with a lot of our allies. So we've got to take a multifaceted approach, make sure we're exporting and make sure we're doing all we can so the production's diversified, take strong stands so that we're not having Russia uh, exert continued influence in that regard, and make sure uh, when there's countries that are really striving hard uh, to become more democratic and more part of the West, uh, like Ukraine, uh, make sure they're not hurt directly, uh, mm -hmm. you know. So you're not combining their aggressive tactics uh, over land militarily with enormous economic pressure. So this seems like a critical issue, this the balancing Russian aggression with energy security. What, and you've both outlined specific issues that we should be pushing. Yeah. What, what's There's a third one too, Nancy, if I could put in that. Okay. And it's obvious. We also have to be sensitive to these countries' energy needs themselves. That's right, the energy security. I mean, we have to balance that That's as right. well. These are our allies, they, they're sovereign countries, they're moving forward themselves. So we're balancing that as a factor as well. And what's, what's the congressional role in this critical issue? Well, I think that uh, we certainly need to be in the game on, on what they do with the Nord Stream pipeline and the trans caucasus pipeline. We can have a voice in that. Um, we need to be watching the change in relationships with Saudi Arabia and Russia. I mean, look at just recently, uh, and our committee has a lot to say in, in how the United States responds to this tectonic shift, bred in part by our energy independence. Of now, Saudi and Russia have been basically controlling the price of oil and trying to keep it propped up. Just in the paper today, they said they've been unable to do that. That's a new historic alignment, and it offers some opportunities for us, but some, some risks as well. Uh, also, on the diplomatic side, uh, we have to create a greater tra transatlantic alliance with our counterparts, uh, with members of parliament in, in these countries as well. Uh, there's so much going on politically there, uh, as well as globally and here, uh, where, you know, you're getting a, a situation where the separatist area, uh, I think I was uh, concerned when uh, our new German ambassador started to uh, issue comments about which side of the ledger their own countries should, whether it should be more conservative parties or not. Uh, I think we have to be careful in, in our role there, uh, that we keep things at a diplomatic level and not use those people that we send for that purpose there to be more divisive. Uh, so we have, to, we have to control ourselves, be as consistent as possible, have resolve. But Congress plays a great role because more and more uh, we're seeing, uh, you know, members of parliament from uh, our allies over here, uh, we're going over there. Uh, honestly, uh, I would like to change the direction already and I'm working on it uh, with allies there and with members of parliament and leaders there, uh, even with uh, President Macron with, when he was here and his delegation. I think we should try and create, uh, you know, uh, take the embers of what was TTIP, the Transatlantic uh, Trade and Partnership Agreement, mm -hmm. and revive that. Instead of playing defense all the time, we really have an opportunity, if we can work together, to have that kind of free trade agreement with the European Union, and we could have a side agreement uh, with the UK. Uh, but we could do these things, and then we're dealing from strength. So one of the roles Congress has, uh, and I believe and I've worked on, and members of our committee have worked on, and, and a separate TTIP caucus has worked on, bipartisan caucus, is to take the offensive to say, hey, we, could, we should have a free trade agreement. That's why these tariffs and these other issues are, are disconcerting. But, you know, they're not fatal. Uh, it, we, we should be moving in the exact opposite direction. But in the, in the framework of strengthening the alliance. And, our, uh, and both of our economies. This is, a, in my view, a free trade uh, agreement with uh, the European Union and with the United States is a win-win situation. And then you have people, countries with shared values, the things we talked about, the rule of law, uh, protection of intellectual properties, the fact that workers uh, should be, uh, you know, given the great remuneration for their work, uh, environmental issues, all those things we share together. And if we work together and put this agreement, we'd have about a half of the world's GDP. And then we're a actually able to influence countries like Russia or China from strength. So 
Uh, Congress will play a great role, I think. I honestly felt that if the TPP wasn't in front of the, the uh, TTIP, the European uh, Union uh, and the U.S. Free Trade Agreement, there's great support, there's great bipartisan support for the for, uh, European Union-U.S. Free Trade Agreement. And Congress will play, I think, a role in reviving that and strengthening it. Yeah, it would be helpful if uh, some of the proposals that are being pushed forward now to get Congress back in the game on approving trade relationships, trade treaties, things like that. You know, our, our, our constitutional powers have suffered severely over the years. Uh, you know, Schles uh, Arthur Schlesinger wrote a book in 1973 called The Imperial Presidency, bemoaning how powerful the executive had become. And look what's happened since 1973. So let's pay attention to some of these bills like they've been proposed. Uh, to, get the, to get the Congress back in Section 301 and some of the trade disputes. Yeah, and I honestly think, at least I can say this, uh, uh, I'm concerned with the use of our, our security powers in, in terms of imposing tariffs. Uh, I don't think yeah, that aligns. It doesn't make any sense. Is that, did I say that diplomatically enough? I, well, yeah. <laughs> it's, you, could, you could make an argument as creating security problems, not. Yes, exactly. So, so trade, energy, economics, you also both have mentioned uh, democracy and the way that democracy is being undermined in large, many parts of Europe by Russian aggression. What, what should our role be in that? How can we counter that, address that, support our allies? Well, that might be an area where you really can play a direct role with your convening power and with partnering with things like IRI and the Democrat, one of those whose acronym I forget, you know, that, that's what the uh, that's what the Ukrainians and Georgians and Poles want. They 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 want to be tied to us and to, and to be supported in their efforts. And the more we can teach them, the more we can bring them. Like Congressman King said, bring them over here, and we go there. The more interchange we can have, I think, the better. Yeah, one of the things we're getting feedback from and have for the last few years has been. Uh, they don't think we've been strong enough, uh, they being our Baltic uh, allies, uh, uh, they don't think we've been strong enough in terms of the communication. Uh, they were complaining to us that they're getting all kinds of uh, information and propaganda from Russia, and it's not being countered as effectively. Our committee's been working on global broadcasting and more use of social media to deal with this and get to, you know, a democratic message forward. Uh, but I still think we have work to do in that regard. And what the feedback that I've been getting from uh, our allies in that area, we have to step that game up as well. But it's something that the committee has been working on uh, to fund and to, and to promote. We're having later this week um, a, a roundtable on Russian cyber aggression uh, downstairs in our Peace Tech Accelerator. Um, this, of course, is something that has dominated a lot of the news over the last several years. Um, and you just mentioned that the committee has been active. Can you say a, a bit more about the ways in which you see, I mean, cyber has become one of these all-encompassing, slightly mysterious uh, realms of concern. Well, it runs a broad gamut from digital ads to some, some very Stuxnet kind of uh, penetration software. So. Uh, some of the best stuff you really can't talk about too much, but clearly exposing digital ads and seeing what they've been able to do in Italy and in Germany uh, uh, would be helpful, as well as here. I think in some of the cyber activity, we're seeing our, our legal system go ahead. I mean, we're prosecuting individuals with Yahoo uh, oh. issue. We're actually moving ahead legally. That's important That's for us to idea. do uh, to the extent that we can. Uh, and then we have to, again, getting back to the theme of uh, a strengthened West, uh, dealing with the cyber issue and the way that they're used to, uh, for corrupt business practices, but also for, uh, you know, uh, affecting our democracies. We're stronger working together. And so again, we have to promote uh, a much better uh, coalition dealing with it because, and uh, particularly from our side, that'll include the private side as well. Uh, Congress has uh, it's been well celebrated on TV when we've had some of the witnesses in from uh, the social media companies uh, in front of Congress uh, trying to hold their feet to the fire. But we have to continue to work. They're part of the solution as well. It's something government itself cannot control. Uh, we can influence and we can do things that are in our realm, but we do need the help uh, of private companies. And we have to be careful too that we don't go so far as hurting our own domestic companies uh, 
and creating greater marketing opportunities for other countries uh, with businesses. So I want to throw it open to the audience for questions. So I know we have a lot of people here with a lot of expertise on their own. We have some mic runners. I'll take two to three questions if you just want to raise your hand and we'll pass a mic to you. Um, and let's start right here. You've got a mic coming to you. Hi, um, my name is Ty Miller. I'm a uh, intern at the Osgood Center for International Studies and I'm a master's student in Russian. And I was uh, spent last summer in Russia and um, I was recently at a talk uh, hearing from Russian opposition ex or perspectives. And then one uh, question I have for you guys is um, one common theme on people in Russia who oppose the Putin regime is they're also like they're pretty, uh, they support the country, and they feel like there's a big difference between separating Russia and then separating from Putin, because it's like Putin and then like 100 people around him that essentially run the country versus 140 million people. And um, how do you, like, is there a way that, because they constantly feel demonized, and like I'm not supporting the Russian um, view, but it's just like giving their perspective. It's like they show me a map and they say like, oh, there's bases around us, and like your military is moving closer and closer. So is there a way that you can, like, isolate the Russian regime and the Putin specifically versus um, demonizing the entire country because the, um, at the talk I went to last week they were saying that the more um, Russia is demonized in the West, it increases Putin's pop popularity there because he can use the propaganda to say that um, everyone hates us and I'm the only one that will save us. Okay, let's see if we've got any other, yeah, back next to Bill. Thank you. Um, my name is Marina Mansour from the State Department, and I wanted to ask about what uh, Congress thinks is the right thing to do in terms of the Russian narrative that is very prominent throughout the Middle East. Um, Russia is really, you know, when you turn on an Arabic channel, the only narrative you hear is the Russian narrative. Um, for instance, with the uh, strikes and retaliation for the chemical attacks. They were saying that, oh, you know, 90% of U.S. missiles were shot down, and we got two of the missiles, and we're going to reverse engineer these Tomahawk missiles. But that was the only narrative. There was no American narrative in the Arabic media. What can we do to fix that? So, two small little questions. Two very <laughs> no, but two very Take similar it away. questions. You know, the, the <laughs> traditional way that we've been successful, in, like in Eastern Europe, is is by things like VOA, Radio Free Europe, things like that, and democracy promotion uh, language that we can put out to counter that narrative. I mean, Putin's uh, making us the, the, the big bad villain is the oldest trick in the book. It's up to us to put ourselves on the map and get information into Russia the same way we're doing it in Iran right now. In fact, I think there's an analogy to Iran with what you're saying there, that the people are not necessarily all the government. And we, ha we have to be able to walk and chew gum at the same time and build up the people and let them know that when, when things change, and they will change, that the United States is not a hostile partner, but is a, uh, or is not a hostile force, but is a partner for them if they want to do the right thing. That's part of it. Uh, the, the, we should do the same thing in Arabic, you know, just like we're broadcasting in Farsi. If, if we don't get our message out, the other guy gets their message out. I'm, so I'm sorry to hear that. I, I know we're successful in Iran, where they have 70% market share. What if we had that in Qatar and Saudi Arabia and the Emirates and everywhere else? Yeah. So they, they shot down our missiles about the same time that Kim won the World Cup, right? Yeah. yeah. Got it. Yeah, it's a, look, they play by different rules. I mean, look at the Malaysian, uh, the downing of the Malaysian aircraft. Uh, I would imagine still the people in Russia believe that we might have been responsible for that uh, right now because of the way they control their news media. Uh, and the judgment we have of whether it's successful or not is not whether we think we are. When we hear from Latvia, we hear from other countries and saying, you're not even close to what we're getting uh, you know, from Russia and what our people are subjected to, then we have to step up our game. We have that ability. Uh, in terms of the Russian people, you're absolutely right, and it's an important distinction to make. It's pretty tough to be in opposition to the government in Russia. Uh, you know, and if you organize that, uh, you disappear. Uh, or you're in prison, uh, or your family's threatened, uh, and you know. And if you leave the country and you're engaged in activities, uh, uh, such was the case in Britain, you, you could even get poisoned. 
So, I mean, th this is hardball, and it's very hard. It was very hard. Uh, I went to Russia just prior to the uh, Winter Games in Sochi, and uh, the way they were controlling things, the way they were trying to deal with anyone that had counter views, they put people so far out, they might as well have been in another country uh, that, that were going to protest, if they were going to protest at all. Uh, the way they cracked down uh, on uh, issues of uh, sexual orientation and what you could do, very different. We have to see, we have to remember how tough it is there. And remember that the Russian people uh, don't necessarily support uh, what Putin is doing. They're suffering and, and living through the consequences economically uh, and in terms of their own personal liberties of doing that. Uh, so any ideas that, you know, just coming back, how we can better connect with the Russian people themselves, that's important. And, and uh, it's a great reminder to people like myself and when we talk about Russia to always try and make a distinction between the Russian leadership and the Russian people themselves. So I'll bear that in mind more and more as I speak. Thank you. This, of course, harkens back to the Cold War days when people-to-people -people initiatives were, mm -hmm. were very active. Um, in fact, I would argue that work that was done laid the groundwork for when the governments changed and the Warsaw Pact fell, that they knew where to turn. And look what's flourished in Croatia, Slovenia, et cetera. Yeah, the other th issue, uh, Nancy, that we didn't deal with uh, are non-proliferation issues and things. Russia is just uh, moving away uh, and just, you know, breaking the agreements we have on non-proliferation. Now, part of the U.S. response is to build a greater strategic uh, nuclear arsenal, too. Uh, my own opinion is we should really look at where the greatest effectiveness is. Not that we don't have to step up our game on some, some uh, weapons issues, but honestly, some of the things we're talking about here, some of that money would be better served trying to build those bridges and to have greater uh, ability to, to forge economic and, and diplomatic ties. And the current, one of our concerns that I think almost everyone on the Foreign Affairs Committee shares is the hollowing out of the State Department that has occurred and how difficult, whether it's in the Middle East, whether it's in uh, Europe uh, or Asia, how difficult that's going to make our job because the State Department isn't at the strength it should be. Uh, and that's going to hurt us. It's going to hurt us in, in our ability to resolve conflicts before th they increase. And it's going to hurt our information slow, uh, our, our, I'm sorry, our information flow in so that uh, we have a better understanding of what's coming down the road. And, and that's a real issue. It, it might sound like a bureaucratic issue. It has substance to it. And we have to do more in making sure our State Department is staffed that way. In that, I'd be interested, some of you from the State Department, I've been hearing from some senior old friends of mine that the morale is starting to improve a little bit. Is that the case? Hmm. And it's pretty bad for a while. <laughs> yeah. Well, I agree with what Congressman Keating said. We, we have to have a vibrant and active deployment of soft power diplomacy. Uh, around the world, uh, engagement with our with countries through our ambassadors and through our uh, geographic uh, divisions in the State Department. It's really sad to see nine of the seven of the top nine jobs vacant. You know, hopefully we'll get that fixed. And you, of course, experienced that firsthand in your years as an ambassador. So you've got well, hearkening back to what you said, uh, what Congressman King said about General Mattis. You know that. It's diplomacy that's supposed to solve the problem, and military deterrence is supposed to be the elephant in the room that you hope never comes out. That's when it works best. Um, other questions? Uh, let's go here, Daniel. And then we'll just pass it next. Good morning. I'm Ron Glass. Uh, I was director for the Office of Democratic Initiatives with USAID in Moscow. Charles North was my boss. Uh, when we got shut down, uh, I call it catastrophic success um, in that period. But the, the question is whole of government. Um, in, in various missions, we've seen there's been a compartmentalization, starting with probably budget in Washington. You have institutions like INL, AID, everyone fighting for limited budgets. I was just wondering if you had any thoughts on on how to get to concerted, um, coherent coordination um, and especially with these difficult issues um, in Europe, uh, probably more important than, than ever. And then just pass it right next to you. 
Hello, my name is Christina Pendergrast. I'm an intern with the Osgood Center. And I was wondering if we could talk a little bit about Russia's influence in our own backyard, namely with Venezuela and the regime there. Given how much infrastructure Venezuela has within the United States, with Sitco and oil and things like that, is the Russian influence there beginning to be of some concern to Congress itself? And if so, what are, we, what are the plans to address that? Thank you. And is, there was one more question, let's see, way in the back. Um, I'm representing the Joint Baltic American National Committee. And to my understanding, Congress wants to get involved and help the alliance in the Baltic region. And my question is, what is the criteria for judging the effectiveness of US involvement in those states and other states like Poland and Ukraine? Okay, budget coherence, Baltics, <laughs> and Venezuela. Let me take a stab at Venezuela since I know more about that part of the world. Uh, you, you hit a really good point. You know, the, the, uh, it's both Iranians and Russians. And the amount of air traffic going in and out of Caracas and La Bajera to Iran and Russia is like, kind of like the New York-Washington shuttle. And no one seems to recognize that. And a lot of it's cargo. There are Russians deployed all over Venezuela, as there are Iranians, also in Nicaragua. And the, one of the biggest fears is if AMLO wins in Mexico, you'll have the opportunity for Russia to re-engage in Mexico as what they consider a historical base of their intelligence apparatus. So I think we need to be vigilant in watching that. I think that's why I was against the, the NICO Act in, in Nicaragua, because of the, regardless of how bad Daniel Ortega is, He's leaving the private sector alone. The country is stable, and we get a lot of information that way. And he will pass, too. He may pass sooner than he thinks. But the bottom line is uh, destabilized countries are fertile petri dishes for Russia. Like I said, in the Baltic area, certainly there's a concern. Uh, there's an internal concern uh, in the whole region, uh, and in Europe, actually, if you broaden it with the fact that the separatist movement and what things are going on, whether or not we're going to be left with alternatives of conservative or more conservative types of government. These are all issues that I think we can influence. Uh, we don't have control over. But certainly, uh, the one thing I think is relevant there, but everywhere uh, right now, is the U.S. has to be uh, more direct and, and clear about where it's coming from. And I can go back another administration, too, and, and say the same thing. And we have to have a resolve. I think there's a fear uh, in that part of the uh, world where the U.S. will get involved, and then will they be there later on? And I think we have to make sure we have great, show great resolve in, in everything we're doing. It's clearly the case in Asia and the Middle East as well. So I think part of that has to be uh, demonstrating that and making it clear uh, as well. Uh, in, in terms of the bureaucracy, Secretary Tillerson testified in front of our committee. Uh, he was trying to deal with it. Even uh, people that uh, advocate greater funding said there's, there are areas in the bureaucracy, assistance to assistance. There are certain assistant positions, perhaps, that aren't necessary that way. They might create greater walls. Uh, uh, people that I know that have gone from, you know, working on the Hill uh, into uh, state sometimes say it, it gets so frustrating because everything's so compartmentalized that they feel like they're closed in and don't have the ability uh, to do that. We, that would be a great thing to try and break down some of those walls uh, and, and deal with it. That should not be, however, an, ex an excuse used to not fund properly. Uh, you know, our state, uh, our State Department, because I think the two things are separate issues. Uh, it's not an excuse to say, uh, well, it's so bureaucratic, we can cut. I don't think the people that we're paying, career people, many of them, their value is incredible. Uh, and it, you just can't, sh you know, shuffle in and out. And I'm really concerned as people leave that we're going to get qualified people with that kind of experience. Uh, staying there. I don't think it's the case yet. Secretary Mattis told that same group I talked with uh, that he's very impressed that, that everywhere he goes, there's people there. They know what they're doing. They're experienced. They're qualified. But we have to look down the road beyond that. So you raise an important issue, but I would make it very distinct that there are walls that can be broken down, but that's just not an excuse to say, well, we've now consolidated things so we can save money. 
Yeah. I would also, oh, please go. Well, I was going to say, you know, I'm a CEO, right, okay? I'm not, I haven't been in the political game very long, really probably not right now. Um, Rex came in, and I know Rex pretty well. We have a joint venture with him in Columbia. Uh, he did the reorganization proposal the way you would do it in a corporation. You hire McKinsey or Booz Allen, they write up a nice big report, you get your two or three top trusted people to go execute it. That's just the opposite of what he should have done in the State Department. He should have built from the bottom up, picked people in every bureau, every geographic office, get somebody to be the, the consultant, if you will, and build a consensus from bottom up. Then there's some ways that you can maybe bring, maybe change some of the bureaus to bring them more in line with the geographic organization. I've, I've heard that there's some competition there that's created some silos, you know. Uh, there's always improvement. But in something like the a government bureau, I think to improve, you've got to improve from within. I would also commend to you the uh, Fragile State Study Group report that USIP did with Carnegie and Center for uh, New American Security. Because I think it goes beyond the State Department. It goes into having a shared understanding of what it is we're trying to accomplish and the role that I think you both have alluded to, the role that democracy fundamentally plays. Is it a government? that cares about its people mm -hmm. and has the ability to take care of them. And that's not always a shared understanding of what is the heart of the problem that then spawns all these other aspects. Um, I want to get one more question in. Um, I'm going to use prerogative of the chair here. <laughs> um, we haven't really talked so much about the relationship between some of the Russian activities and the rise of these authoritarian nationalist governments in Europe, um, which is a related concern to a lot of what we've already discussed. Mm -hmm. what, how, what, how are you thinking about that in the committee? What can and should we be doing? Well, I certainly exploited the migrant issue in Italy and in Germany and everywhere else. Um, we have, um, we, we definitely need to uh, bring visibility to that and support the countries that seem to try to solve it in a humane manner, you know. Like I, I like the idea of uh, France and, and Italy moving to, to have uh, some effort to keep people in Eritrea and get them jobs there and train them up there rather than have them get on a boat and risk their life, that kind of stuff. And of course, today is World Refugee Day, so yeah, it's appropriate. fitting. So the migrant thing is part of it, and then the other things that we talked about are a big part of it, with the cyber and the. But especially since, if we w seek to strengthen the alliance, if we're losing the alliance from the rise of these authoritarian regimes, that of course further complicates the solution. I, and I think too that uh, just as uh, the question uh, surfaced around the Russian people, we have to remember the way Russian. Russia is really being run uh, through oligarchs uh, and through the uh, profiting of uh, billionaires and billionaires that are actually uh, controlling much of what Russian policy is. And they will look at very ripe targets uh, around the world, and Europe in particular, where if there's any corruption that's there, if there's any thing that they can take advantage of from a business perspective, that they will do it. Uh, and certainly, you know. You've seen authoritarian. You saw uh, uh, Yanukovych, uh, you know, in uh, Ukraine. You saw some of these people put into positions uh, where they really represent protecting the interests of oligarchs doing business mm -hmm. in many of these countries, and that makes Russia, I think, a bit unique. Uh, but they thrive on those authoritarian type of governments because part of what makes them go is the fact that. They're, they're driven by the profit-making of Putin and the oligarchs, and they thrive on this. So I think there's a, a business side to their policy-making that's kind of unique in trying to create these authoritarian regimes, because if it is built that way, uh, when one person has that much influence, it's easier to corrupt, it's easier to profit and do business as well. So there's a, that aspect of it, I think, yeah. as well. Yeah, that's a good point. You know, in a sense, they never really instituted capitalism in Russia. It's basically the, a group of F Putin's friends got a hold of all the companies, and that's the way it is now. To some extent, the same way as Azerbaijan, but I understand it's been 
more diffuse now. So you could almost make an argument that the Chinese are more entrepreneurial and capitalist right now than the Russians. So you know, you got to face, you basically have an authoritarian monolith, as Congressman Keating said, that transcends the government and goes through all areas of, of business. If you, you ever read that book uh, by Bill Browder about his effort to start a hedge fund in, in Burn, Burn Red Notice, what's the name? It's a pretty tough place to work. Well, we are just about out of time. I want to um, thank both of you for coming and see if you have any final thoughts you'd like to leave us with on the issue, on the way that your committee is attacking this issue and working together to do so. Well, I, I want to end with a little uh, optimism that I mentioned before. We, we always appreciate that. And, and it truly, the U.S. is in a great position. Our allies are still there uh, working with us, although these are tough times. Uh, so we have to go away realizing that we do have the ability to exert enormous influence for democracy, for rising, uh, you know, levels of uh, living, uh, you know, the rate of living in many of these places and paying people well. And we should be a model, because if you go around the rest of the, the world and away from Europe and away from Russia, uh, there's a huge, uh, massive number of young people that have, are beyond hope of any kind of uh, economic well-being, anything in their lives. They're incubators for disruption, extremism, and the things we're fighting. Uh, we should look at our alliances in the West uh, and use that as a model, uh, and then be able to exert that power economically around the world to help these other areas of the world. It's all connected. And if we can't succeed in Europe, if we can't succeed uh, on the front, uh, of the Russian activities in Europe together with our allies. We will never be successful in these other parts of the world. So uh, there's a, a great incentive for us to show that strength together and work together. And I want to leave people with this thought. There's a great opportunity. It makes sense on both sides of the Atlantic to be dealing with this. And I believe when something makes sense like that, uh, it's ripe for uh, becoming the, uh, really accomplished. Yeah, I'm going to be an optimist. I don't think our 240-something years of shared values with Europe, uh, I think those are going to withstand some of the things that have been put in play recently. And we'll have the opportunity to continue to work together with our European partners to deal with other parts of the world. The, the comment about separation of the people from the government is a really good one. And, you know, we have opportunity. You, you go back to Yugoslavia and the Balkans. It worked there. And, and the Dayton Accords have held. And so now I think we need to kind of play for the long ball in some of these countries, uh, support what we can, and, and have the patience to be ready to, to have the people uh, want to come to, the, want to, come to de democracy when they have the opportunity. And, and if we can do that and have the patience, which is not always an American trait, then I think we can, we can, we can win the game. I want to thank you both, Congressman Keating, Congressman Rooney. This has been a thoughtful conversation. We really appreciate both your leadership on the Hill, your thoughtfulness, and the optimism that you're leaving us with. Please join me in thanking our two speakers today. <laughs>